Welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment clinic in Seattle, Washington. On this podcast, we talk about all things food, body, movement, and mental health. I'm Dr. Lexi Giblin, your host for today, and I'm here with Miss Kara Bazi. Hi, everyone. And Kara is our Opal uh, clinical director and, of course, one of the founders, along with Julie Church and I. And we are joined today by Poppy and Lily, um, who will be doing self-inquiry on this episode in a bit. Hello, Poppy and Lily. Hi. So glad to have you with us today. So in this self-inquiry series, we conduct Opal Self-Inquiry Group on the podcast. Uh, So listeners, as many of you may already know, will learn the self-inquiry process and potentially find uh, resonance and inspiration in the difficult questions that are posed uh, to take to their own self-inquiry work. And if you are new to self-inquiry or you would just like a refresher or you would like to cajole yourself into the self-inquiry mode, listen to my short self-inquiry overview episode. So before we hear from Poppy and Lily, uh, let me throw out just a couple reminders. So in self-inquiry, we are going opposite to where we typically go with our emotions, and that is towards them. That is towards difficult emotions. So we're, we're choosing to go where we resist Um, with a particular goal in mind, and that particular goal is learning. And in in self-inquiry, we assume that the most painful emotions that we experience as humans are full of great questions and great learning and deep understandings that we would not otherwise be able to access if we didn't sit in those emotions and ask these questions with curiosity around what the learning is. So Poppy and Lily have just done um, a five-minute journal process, self-inquiry process, and in that process they found, they followed basically three steps where they identified a specific time where they experienced an unwanted emotion, and they took themselves back into that emotionally. So it's an experiential, so where you are feeling what you felt when the experience originally happened. Um, And then the second step is to get curious and ask that question, what is the learning here? And then finally, we're looking to find a a reminder. um, So what what is a good question to get you back to this learning in the future? And what questions do you not want to ask? And so the questions are intended to make you feel some kind of way. And that some kind of way is something you don't want to feel. <laughs> so they're intended to be dysregulating and uncomfortable. And of course, we ask those questions to ourselves and to each other with, with, um, with kindness, right? Because we're, we're supporting the person's growth and learning, and they are consenting to this experience of being asked difficult questions in the spirit of learning and growth. So as I said, if you want to learn more, go to the self-inquiry overview episode and um, get a deeper dive there. So without further ado, Poppy or Lily, would you um, take us into your self-inquiry work? Sure, I could go first. Great. Great. Um, this is Poppy. You just want me to just, yes, this yeah. is Poppy. If you want me to just jump in. Yeah, great, Poppy. That's perfect. Take us into sure. your self-inquiry. Um, so this is um, a wrestling match that I'm having with myself about um, about my body and specifically um, my like athlete body. Um, recently I did some athletic testing for a research project, um, and it involved running while wearing an EKG on my chest. Um, and when I took my shirt off to have the sensors put in place, I found myself, um, 
sort of like unknowingly staring at the other woman who was there um, also doing the test and comparing my body to hers. Um, in my recovery process, I have gained a significant amount of weight. Um, um, and in that moment, uh, when I was comparing myself to this other woman, I just felt this immense shame and disgust, um, this desire to withdraw and run away, but also I couldn't because I was doing this thing. And so I had to mask all of that and sort of puff up and pretend like everything was fine um, while I'm having these thoughts about how I don't look like a runner or any kind of athlete anymore. Um, and this hatred for my body was just so big and the shame was even bigger. Um, but I couldn't run away. Um, so I had to just sort of pretend like things were fine. And I kept thinking, I don't, I, I know all of the things that people are going to tell me about how there's no one athlete body. There's no specific runner's body. And the, the idea that there is, is incredibly harmful. Um, but this part of me that feels so much body disgust just like doesn't care about any of that and craves my smaller body, craves this feeling of putting on my running clothes and having them skim over my skin and just like feeling lighter and bouncier in my movement. I was standing there in that moment, like knowing that I was about to do this run and feel heavy and now also emotionally heavy and and feeling like I couldn't talk to anyone about this feeling because they're just going to tell me that I need to buy different clothes or like do strength work so that I can handle having a heavier body and in reality I was just standing there wanting my old body back and feeling so much sadness and shame and disgust and um, this this whole um, this whole thing is definitely an old story that that I have that I've struggled with for I don't know two decades at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, I came up with some questions at the end, but they don't feel all that helpful. Um, could you give us a sense of those so we make sure we don't repeat them? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, my, my, the first question I asked myself was, what if being in my old body wouldn't actually make me feel like more of an athlete or just like wouldn't make me feel better at all. Um, so basically like what if I'm wrong? Um, and why does a certain body type seem like it will help me feel more included in the running community? Okay. Thanks, Poppy. And are you, are you open to questions from Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Okay. I have, I think I have a clarifying question before we move to the self-inquiry questions. Sure. Um, and that is just around, are, are you in a place of recovery right now? Or is this coming from more of a place of manning, managing your body disgust while um, not in recovery? Um. How are you defining recovery? <laughs> Great question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So maybe somewhere there's some somewhere in between recovered and I certainly and would not consider disorder. myself recovered. Um, 
uh, I'm uh, like say maybe this helps. Are you are you asking if she's actively using eating disorder behaviors as a way is is in in kind of the yeah relationship I think, I think between so. the body discussed. I think so because I think where my questions may be different depending on um, whether you're responding to these experiences with um, eating disorder symptoms or whether you're responding to this body discussed by in other ways. Um, I guess I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, definitely there, I wouldn't say that there's an absence of eating disorder behavior. Um, I'm currently in one of those spaces where like my eating disorder behavior doesn't work. Um, but I'm still doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I have a, I have another clarifying question and that is, is when you, th- when you're thinking about your own, like when you're getting into the dysregulation, is it more dysregulating around your perception of your body and the body discussed, or was there more dysregulation around wanting to run away and feeling trapped in that experience because you were doing this testing? Like, did, um, does one feel stronger than the other? Like the not being able to run away versus the, um, the body discussed feels stronger. stronger. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So self inquiry questions for Poppy. I think at one that comes to mind, you said that you felt because of the situation you were in, you you had to pretend like things were fine. Um, and mm-hmm. my question would be, where did you get the idea that you have to pretend? Or what would it be like to be real in that moment? Definitely some quick answers. Okay. Okay. And for those of you who are new to self-inquiry, we always were suspicious of quick answers and and self-inquiry. And I think Poppy's referring to that, like knowing that Mm -hmm. sometimes the quick answers are kind of ways of trying to regulate ourselves and move away. I have one. Um, Do you find that um, you believe that people, including yourself or maybe only yourself, that only people in smaller bodies are deserving and worthy of participating and enjoying certain kinds of movement and that if they are not in those bodies in those and engaging in those certain movements that they are not deserving of the joy, the companionship or other um, aspects of movement. That question definitely stirs something up. I have something around what what are people missing with you by giving you these answers around all bodies in the recovery community around all bodies fit um, for sport and then that inclusion like I, I just have some question around what is being missed how are you being missed in that I don't know that that's really a self inquiry question though. Um, even if it's not a self-inquiry question I like it because yeah it's right and it's making me cry yeah Um, okay can you say that again Kara yeah like what is being there's something in the recovery community what is being missed about knowing Poppy by giving these answers around inclusive bodies in the athlete community. 
the approach people are taking, there's, there's something that is not like in, what needs are not getting met or what way of being known is not getting met. I think I, I think one of my my questions is kind of in a similar vein. Um, was that you didn't you talked about not wanting to go to anyone and let them know what you were feeling because you were concerned you were just going to hear things you didn't that weren't going to be mm-hmm. helpful. And so I think I have there's some question around like. Um, uh, I, I, I think the questions are like, um, are you not reaching out to the the people who or how, are you are you communicating? Are you being clear about what you need from people? Um, and is the solution to just withdraw? Where did you get the idea that the solution was to just hold it in and deal with it on your own? Poppy, does that do? Is are we hitting on anything with? Oh yeah, okay. I'm just crying over okay. here. Okay, okay. The only other note I had made was um, around asking a question like around envy. If if you would, are you someone who's familiar with feeling envy? Um, and I, I think that's more of a self-inquiry question of not a clarifying one, but just like okay. what does the word envy bring up in you? And yeah, envy I don't like, like this. That question. Yeah. So sometimes and sometimes it's hearing words and thinking, ah, am I a person who is envious? Like that itself can bring up feelings. Of course, envy is like this shame blended with anger. And maybe related to the question I earlier asked, too, is there unexpressed anger towards the people giving you those answers, the recovery, the quote-unquote recovery answers? Yeah, this is is hitting buttons. Yeah, so... To follow that, what is what is this saying about your relationships? Okay, Poppy, that's a lot of heat on. Yeah, but it sounds like we hit on some some potential lines of learning for you. Yeah, I've got I've got quite a bit that. I need to dig into now. Okay. Really appreciate you sharing. So, Lily. Hi. Would you be willing to share your self-inquiry work with us? Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, thanks for being brave and going first, Poppy. Um, yeah, when I, I was journaling I was I was trying to think of very recent you know isolated situations and all, all I could think of were were just the numerous many isolated situations where I've kind of had a, a similar reaction and unwanted feelings so um just for for context um Ever since I was in about middle school or so, and I'm, I'm in my 30s, um, I have just been, I have felt this need to be so agreeable, um, you know, wanting people to like me, wanting people to love me, wanting people to give me praise. And over time, that has morphed into not just seeking love and praise, but wanting to go you know, so far beyond people's expectations that they would just never be disappointed in me or, or let down by me. And, 
this has come up um, and still comes up in my role as, as a friend, as an athlete, or how I identify as an athlete, as a partner, as a lover, a daughter, you know, in all roles of my life that historically um, I would go so far against my own values and wants, needs, my own emotions, and even just void myself of those things to ensure that every part of me is what people are expecting and more. So they'll be pleased, they won't be bored, they'll be impressed, whatever. And that has knowingly made me feel icky, like going against my own values and my own emotions. Like that feels icky to me. But to me, like I've just made that ickiness very acceptable. Like it's a small cause so long as people are okay with me. Um, and in my recovery work, I mean, a lot of my work is around vulnerability and authenticity and, you know, whether it's boldly or subtly or somewhere in between and showing my authentic self to others and like feeling that. Um, but, it, but in this, this group of situations, you know, some of them are really small time, low risk, one off, and, and some of them are very more intense and I perceive there to be a lot more risk. Um there have been so many times when, when I feel that I have not performed or behaved to someone's expectations or that they are disappointed in me or maybe they're hurt by my actions, um, I am just so overcome by this. I'm sorry, I'm really getting nervous to say this out loud. I feel like I'm outing myself. Like, I... I'm so overcome by this urge, this like deep urge to be smaller, like to shrink myself, like physically, my personality, my emotions, my actions, whatever. Um, you know, I, I feeling like I, I did this urge to shrink myself. I know it blocks me from authenticity and, and for me, recovery, because I don't like smallness. It just, it feels like right in those moments. Like I have done this to someone and therefore I need to like retreat into smallness. I need to shrink myself. Um, this is what, you know, not only like this is what I deserve, but like retreating into smallness it makes me feel under control like this will be fixed I can fix this this way it'll make me better next time um, and therefore I will be acceptable again to others um, and you know this situation has come up very recently very minor but I still felt this urge so deeply um, and the feelings the the feelings that come from that, that are really painful, are, are definitely shame. Um, also, a lot of desperation. You know, I feel so bad that I want this to be okay, but I cannot shrink myself fast enough, but I'm so desperate for that. Um, a, a feeling of, like, emptiness and hollowness. Maybe it's more of a sensation, but just, like, this overwhelming emptiness but the most painful one is definitely and it's taken me a long time to put you know kind of a word to this feeling because I don't really associate myself with this feeling but just deep profound worthlessness like I screwed up um I deserve this I don't matter laying like the smaller that I am the more I shrink, the closer I'll get to this just like, you know, like disappearing, um, which to me feels like acceptable for the other person. Um, and, the, and the question, I, I mean, I asked myself two questions. The first one, I'm, I'm just always curious, like, why do I retreat to a facade of smallness when I really long for authenticity? Um, but also... And the one that it get that gets me, like where the learning is, it like this all just feels like self sabotage and punishment. 
And it, and it, that has costs also, and it does not feel good. But why am I so drawn to that? Um, you know, when I long for authenticity and, and sometimes in a bold way, like why am I so drawn to self-sabotage and punishment? Oftentimes when it's not being given by the other person, you know, instead of self-compassion and giving myself grace. And that's kind of where I ended. Okay. okay. And you're you're open to questions from us? I am. Okay. Wait, because I have some. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> so I guess there are two that are swirling around in my mind right now. Um, you know, you spoke about spending so much of your energy trying to be agreeable. Um, and um, you, you give this like agreeableness to other people, but you don't really get it back for yourself. And I'm wondering what it would take for you to feel worthy of something like self-compassion or like that softness um, that would allow you to be worthy of being a human who makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, my other question is related to uh, those painful emotions that you mentioned, um, the shame and the emptiness and that intense worthlessness. And I'm curious if throughout your life you have adapted in ways that somehow have come to make those feelings soothing. Like there's something soothing about shrinking into shame and emptiness and worthlessness. Related to what Poppy just asked, my big question is where did you learn to bypass anger? Mm -hmm. that's an interesting one that I have not thought of yeah and I say that kind of in a big picture it feels like um, anger is missing Yeah, so I could have a whole yeah. series of those. <laughs> Where did you learn to bypass mm -hmm. anger? What makes you think anger isn't important? Yeah, that's Why aren't you holding anger outside of yourself? What makes you think you're truly connected to people without anger? So I'd have a whole series of anger inquiry questions. Yeah, and I feel like I have so many quick answers for that, too. But also, it's something I haven't thought of too much, so. Um, I have um, a line of questions that may be related to what Kara just asked, but I hear that from an early age, you know, you've you were really interested in being in being lovable, and that kind of guided a lot of your of your decision making and how you were. And so, my question is, what if being agreeable actually makes you less lovable? Mm. 
And then to add to what Kara posed, what if holding back your anger and being agreeable makes you less lovable? Mm-hmm. That's hard to think of. That's mm-hmm. like a hard line of thinking mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, what if your whole pursuit isn't working in the way that you think it's working? Yeah. And in some ways the the self-sabotage or the pun at the shrinking is a protective pathway to avoid that. Like, what if it's really not about that? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Another question that comes to mind is what if, what if this, Uh, punishment of self, shrinking yourself, is actually selfish. That's a really hard one. Mm. Like making you less available to your people, to the world. Gosh, I feel like I have so many comeback statements for them (laughs) that I just don't want to put out there. But yeah, that is hard. That does feel like a hard one. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I have so much. Oh my gosh, yeah. And you're getting dis- – there is dysregulation even with the quick answers. I don't – yeah. I, there is um, almost um, – I f- I'm feeling like the – like my response would be defensive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially with the question of like, you know, what if your pers- pursuit is for not essentially like – my pursuit of being agreeable is actually making me less lovable. Um, But also like, what if that is selfish? Um, Yeah. Cause I, I feel like I've tried to avoid that, the selfishness, but what if it it is? And what does that mean? That's really, Mm -hmm. yeah, that is hard. Okay, any remaining self-inquiry questions for for Lily? Not for me. Okay. Not for me. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got it. Yeah. My, me neither. Okay. So thank you, Poppy and Lily, for taking us into your brave difficult self-inquiry work. It's much appreciated. Um, and I know I'm leaving today feeling moved by your your willingness to consider these difficult ideas and questions that we were posing. And if you are interested in doing self-inquiry on the air with us, um, submit an application by clicking on the link in the episode description And if you want to learn more about self-inquiry, go to our self-inquiry overview episode, as I said. And thank you to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering. Thanks to Aaron Davidson for Appetite's original music and to David Bozzi for editing. If you want to learn more about Opal's programming, go to opalfoodandbody.com. Until next time.